first of all, so welcome to everybody. And let me thank uh, Fanny and Emmanuel for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to give this course. And uh, um, so we'll have, OK, eight hours together. So I want to uh, give a glimpse of the research which is going on on uh, area preserving flows on surfaces. So maybe let me just say why. So first of all, I will, I will try to convince you today, uh, flows on surfaces are one of the most uh, uh, basic dynamical systems. So this is kind of, will be a course in dynamical systems. And we'll, there are some people that I understand are not in dynamics. And you will get a glimpse of uh, some dynamical problems in this specific contest. So it's quite fundamental in dynamical systems. And then it's the topic of research in which, uh, which is very much linked to my own history and my own research, because I, I started giving kind of contribution in this area uh, since my PhD. Then I kind of went back uh, to do other things for several years. But there have been significant advances okay, in the past uh, uh, decades. And especially right now in the, next, in the last uh, few years, there has been a revival and lots and lots of new research going on on deeper and deeper chaotic properties, which I will try to outline to today. So it's a fundamental topic in dynamics, and it's very active, especially right now, as I will try to explain. And uh, um, let me tell you, we have, I have eight hours. So my goal for today is to give a very gentle introduction to somehow I want today will be very general structure of the course. We will give some basic definitions. And I will kind of present uh, stating maybe a little bit informally, but many of the results which give a view on what, uh, what is happening in this area. So we will have some basic notions. and also some uh, informal statements of several results. So you should think of today as an overview of what will we do uh, in more detail later on. So this is today. And then we'll have uh, this week. Somehow it's a more gentle week. So the second, uh, the second class, which will be Thursday, I will also introduce some uh, background and, and basic tools. So especially, it will be kind of we got some fundamental tools in dynamics and related and to the topic. And then there will be a one week break. And in two weeks from now, there will be two more lessons. And if anybody really wants to go deep into or well, get a sense of really uh, techniques and proofs, I would like to say you have to wait techniques. So there are not so many experts. So there are many people that I think will enjoy the first week. But, and then I hope you will keep coming to the second part. But I was going to say, if there was any expert in the audience, I <laughs> would tell them you should really go into the second week to see really uh, proofs in depth. OK. So what? What is the topic of the course? This is structure. But uh, so as I said, we are talking of dynamical systems. And uh, dynamical systems are also, you can think of them as group actions. But uh, the two basic cases uh, are iterations of a map. So if you have a map in the space, uh, this gives you a, a dynamical system. And this is what is called sometimes a discrete time dynamical system. You can think of this map as describing the evolution of the system in units of time which are uh, discrete. And if t is invertible, you can think of this as a z action on the space uh, x. So to n, you associate t to the n, and this acts on the space x. But the other. Uh, so it depends. Some people like discrete. Some people like uh, continuous dynamical systems. Uh, so the second example, when the time is continuous, 
So continuous dynamical system, continuous time dynamical system, it's given by a flow. So I will write uh, this notation with parentheses uh, to indicate that it's a one parameter family of transformations of your space. And uh, the index t is parameterized by r. And another way to say uh, a flow, it's essentially an r action. So to each t, we associate a transformation of my space. And we have the property that for the, uh, phi 0 is the identity. And uh, we have the group pro property. So if I flow for time t plus s, this is the same than flowing from time s and then flowing for time t for every t and s in R. And uh, so this, uh, of course, will be mostly on flows. We have flows in the title. But uh, to study flows, not today, but next week, we will also study some one-dimensional maps, which are interval exchange transformations. So we'll have an excursion into, into uh, maps, as Poincaré maps of flows. But mostly, we are concerned with flows. And what should you think of the main example of flows? Flows arise as a, a solution to differential equations, for example. And let me uh, give you the one example which will be relevant for what we will do later today. So say that I give you, let me give you the example of uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, I want to give you an example of Hamiltonian flows. So let's start from the plane. We will go to surfaces soon. But say that I give you a function from R2 to R, which is uh, smooth. And uh, this is what well, sometimes is called Hamiltonian. And uh, I give you just the following in two dimensions. We are here just the following uh, differential equation. x dot is dh dy, and y dot is minus dh dx. <coughs> so let me call it h, this for Hamiltonian. This is an example of a, a differential equation. And I can look at the solution. And the solution will define a flow. So I can define phi t of a point x0, <coughs> y0 in R2 as uh, uh, xt, yt, where this is uh, the point reached in time t with initial condition uh, with by the solution with initial condition x0, y0 by solution of h such that x0, y0 is x0, y0. Okay. So flows are solutions of differential equations and this is just one example, Hamiltonian. I want to mention it because we'll see uh, soon uh, flows on surfaces, which are uh, in some sense Hamiltonian, but we will get to that. And uh, um, okay, Hamiltonian system, of course, are appear <coughs> in, in many problems in mathematical physics, in celestial mechanics, but this is not the topic of my course. And more in general, you could also have uh, a manifold, and I mean, let me not write a manifold, the vector field, and then we can look at the integral curves of the vector field, and that will also define a flow. So we want to focus on this course. <coughs> uh, I want to focus on uh, smooth. I'll put smooth. I put it in parentheses because sometimes we leave the smooth <coughs> word, but smooth, low dimensional, 
dynamical systems. Okay, so smooth law dimensional. So which dimensions do we have? So if you go to dimension one, well, okay, I don't even want to do flawless, just two maps. If my space is uh, the circle, it's a compact one-dimensional manifold, then, and you look at the transformation from S1 to S1, which is smooth, smooth diffeo. This is one of the most basic dynamical systems you can try to study. And, but you enter a very well-known theory, so the theory of uh, circle diffeomorphisms. So many people might have uh, encountered circle diffeomorphisms. Sometimes it's an introductory course in dynamical systems. Uh, Arthur Avila, who was now in Zurich, we just became colleagues, and he just taught a graduate course on the theory of circle diffeos. And of course, I'll if you wanted to know about this, you should have gone to <laughs> someone was there. It was a student of Arthur who was there, but. Uh, Today, we're not going to do dimension one, we're going to do dimension two. So all the course, so this course is all about dimension two. <coughs> and it's all about uh, flows uh, on uh, compact uh, surfaces. So let me say throughout the course, basically, I just want uh, uh, from now on, every time I write S on the board, maybe we write notation. So our space uh, X will be S, and S throughout the course will be a closed, closed surface. So I want something which is a smooth surface, so smooth, connected, Orientable, orientable and compact, and no boundary. Okay. <coughs> so uh, let me just plot. <laughs> let me just draw this. <coughs> Two-dimensional smooth manifold, compact, no boundary. So a surface. And uh, uh, that just also notation. So G is all always going to be the genus of my surface. And uh, we will not work on spheres or so we will start from the torus. So the genus will be greater than one. And mostly, in some sense, I will talk a lot about some on passant about the torus, but somehow what I feel more affectionate to and what I mostly worked on is uh, higher genus, so genus from two above. So the focus will be on surfaces of genus two and above. And uh, um, okay, so we have a space, will be a surface, and we will look at uh, uh, flows, let me just define. And as I said, uh, mostly they will be smooth flows on surfaces, and I will get into that in a second. Uh, but what I want to say is that uh, I want to do ergodic theory. So within dynamical systems, people in ergodic theory want to study dynamical systems which preserve a measure. So I will assume Basically, we'll only talk about conservative or dynamical systems, sometimes they are called, and the FIT will preserve, will be uh, area preserving. Well, let me write it, I will be more precise in a second. And uh, let me, I will, uh, let me just say that this is the ergodic theory setup. So for, as I said, there are some people who are not in dynamics, so maybe let me, I will also give basic definitions, even though maybe I don't spend too much time on that. So what is the ergodic theory setup? 
So you will, the ergodic theory, you want to look at a space, which is a measure space. Probability, actually. So you have, on your space, you also have a sigma algebra of measurable sets and the measure. And uh, actually, I will restrict to the case of finite measure, and you can assume probability measure. And uh, when you look at uh, a flow, if you flu f your flow preserves a measure, so what you want to ask that first of all these transformations are measurable. So, for example, pre-images of measurable sets are measurable. Uh, and the measure of a set doesn't change when you flow. So measure of A is e measure of phi t of A uh, is equal to measure of A for every A in my sigma algebra. Okay? Or if you have a transformation, you want something similar, but uh, in general, if the transformation is not invertible, it's important to look at pre-images of sets. So pre-images have the same measure than the original set, OK? So and that's the type of uh, uh, this, these sometimes are called conservative dynamical systems. And I need to erase. So I guess it's here. <coughs> I'll leave the title. Now we are building momentum for. Uh, and because we are going to work mostly with smooth dynamical systems, I will basically, uh, maybe I will put it here. For us, the sigma algebra we will mostly be, uh, for us, it will be Borel sigma algebra. So we will work on manifolds or spaces which have a topology, and the measurable sets will be generated by open sets. OK, okay time to give a very basic example. And we'll build also in the examples will build. Uh, OK, and uh, sorry, maybe one more word. So in this ergodic theory setup, we will investigate chaotic properties. So maybe I will uh, leave a general philosophy how chaotic can a smooth uh, conservative uh, low dimensional <laughs> dynamical system B. Maybe this could be a little bit the leading uh, subtitle. And I borrowed this, actually, there is a recent paper by. Uh, Basam Fayyad and Giovanni Forni and, uh, and Adam Kanigowski, who starts with this sentence, how chaotic can a smooth dynamical system be? And they show you that for some genus one smooth flows, you can have Lebesgue spectrum, which is a property of very much uh, uh, probabilistically chaotic dynamical system. So our objective will kind of be looking at some kind of typical smooth uh, flows and see which chaotic features they can display. And chaotic properties I will define soon. Mostly we will talk about mixing. We will talk about many other things in between. And I will define them as we need them. So OK, so it's a general overview. And now let me give you a first example of an area-preserving flow on a surface. And this is the most basic example, perhaps. First of all, am I, are you happy I'm not going too fast or am I talking loud? I mean, complain if I'm too fast, too slow, if you cannot read, if you cannot hear me. Usually I shout, so. OK, so linear flows on the torus. OK? 
Again, apologies if some of you works in dynamical system, you probably have seen this example, but today is the day for putting everybody on the same footing, so I'm mostly going gently also for people in other areas, okay? Okay, so, and then it's also good that we'll, we'll use some things later on, so, okay. So basic example, so space is a surface, and I want to look at uh, genus one. So I'm going to look at the torus, R2 mod Z2. And I'm just going to draw a square. And uh, you should think it's just uh, in your mind. Um, it's just uh, R2 mod Z2, the fundamental domain. You can take a unit square. And you need to think that opposite sides of the square are uh, the same modulo z2. So if you glue them by translations, topologically, this is a torus. So this is actually a flat torus. So it's a torus which uh, we show as a Euclidean uh, manifold. And uh, so I'm going to fix an angle in S1. So this is an angle. And then you can just look a uh, very basic uh, flow. I'm going to write it as differential equation. X dot and Y dot uh, are equal to cosine and sine of your angle. <coughs> so here I'm just constant linear differential equation. So maybe it's a uh, overkill to find it like this. but. So the solutions, so phi t, theta, phi t, theta. Uh, I'll denote this theta to remember the direction. <coughs> Our solutions is the solutions given, is the flow given by solutions to star, OK? And, uh, uh, and it's called the linear flow because clearly, basically, what I'm doing if I fix an angle theta, I'm just moving on li lines in direction theta. So cosine and sine are constant. The velocity is constant. And because I'm on the torus, I just have to use the identification. So every time my line leaves the boundary, it comes back by using the identifications, right? So I'm f and this picture really, if I plot it on the, on the torus, then I'm I cannot do it. I'm traveling over uh, lines which wind on the torus, straight lines in the plane. And uh, OK. And clearly, um, I'll write it here, Fit preserves Lebesgue measure. So mu is equal to Lebesgue area on the torus. OK? That makes sense on T2. And this is one of the most basic dynamical systems, and we know everything about it. And if you want to be interesting and do something in genus one, you can start perturbing it. So I can start adding some small perturbation to this constant linear flow, and then you enter the real of KAM theory. If you want to put the Diophantine condition on theta, you can ask if when I perturb, I get something genuinely new, if I can have new different properties, or I can get a dynamical system which is conjugated to the original one. And this is not the topic of my course. It's a very well uh, studied area, and people maybe could do Hamiltonian or KAM. Some of you told me they are know uh, everything about this. I don't want to uh, do this. I want to move to higher genus. I told you my focus is genus two and above. So second example will be uh, genus two. And let me, uh, me, before I do the example, maybe wait, let me put a remark. So if the genus is greater than two, uh, so this was an example of a flow which is uh, uh, non-singular. So uh, the derivative is uh, non-zero at every point. It's constant, right? So if I go to higher genus, let me remark that I need to allow for fixed points of my flow. 
So uh, uh, for singularities of the flow. So let me just say, so, so any smooth uh, fit has uh, fixed points. So I will call them singularities. I will give you a picture in a second. And uh, let me say that we always will assume that uh, uh, these are isolated. They are uh, isolated uh, finite order, order zeros. And uh, in particular, we are on a compact uh, surface, so I want to have finitely many singular points. This will be another standing assumption. So what are these fixed points? So basically, as you can think of this for differential equation, you can think of points where the derivative is zero and they have to be isolated. And then you can just uh, classify uh, how they can look. And this is again some basic, if you I don't like to teach dynamical systems on flows and some linearization, but if you ever see any type of some basic course, you can kind of compute how a face portrait of a area preserving flow looks near a singularity. So let me just draw the picture. So this is an example of a fixed point which is a center. So this is a point which doesn't move, and around I have some closed trajectory of my flow. <coughs> and this is uh, also and then an island of closed trajectory, closed flow trajectory. <coughs> or they could be, for example, simple saddles. <coughs> so this is the plot of a seat, maybe I should orient also my trajectories. This is another fixed point, which is a saddle. And uh, a simple saddle because it's a single zero of the uh, uh, differential and the Hessian, for example, is non-zero. Non so if you have, a, say, you think of a differential equation with non-zero Hessian, the determinant of the Hessian is non-zero, and then you have uh, a local phase portrait like this. So that's how your orbits will look in a neighborhood of your point. So they will have uh, these red lines which go into the singularity. Uh, I will call them separatrices. OK? So we have center, we have simple saddle, and maybe I will do there is another example which has what I will generically call multi saddle or degenerate saddle. And I will draw one, but it could be with basically you want an even number, but greater than four of uh, incoming outgoing separatrices. So this would be, mm, you can orient them one in, one out. One, uh, yeah. did I put an even number? Yes, out, no, <laughs> uh, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, okay. Mm -hmm. And then you can orient your flow. Okay, so this is the type of picture that you will see at finitely many points of your flow. <coughs> and again, we want a concrete example. So I'll give you two types of concrete examples. <coughs> ah, and maybe... Uh, let me, why did I say that there are, there if the genus is greater than two, there have to be uh, fixed points. So let me recall you what is uh, poincare hopf theorem. Uh, if you haven't seen this, it doesn't matter. It's just, uh, uh, just a fact. So 
To each of these uh, fixed points, you can associate the index of the fixed point. So the index is kind of telling you uh, how a little unit tangent vector, what is the degree? OK, if you take a unit tangent vector and move around the fixed point, how many times you rotate around yourself? So if you don't know, it doesn't matter, but take as a definition that the index of a center is equal to 1, index 1. The index of a simple set though is equal to minus 1. I hope I didn't mess up the uh, signs. And the index of the multi set though, so there, say that there are 2k uh, prongs. Prongs are the uh, separatrices. Then it's uh, uh, minus, uh, I hope it's minus k. Uh, let's check. So, no. <laughs> um, index minus 1, uh, no, uh, I should have written it. Uh, minus uh, k halves. <laughs> Uh, is it? No. <laughs> uh, let me check <laughs> if I wrote something on my notes. Um, what's the index of a saddle of degree 6? Anybody? <laughs> uh, ah, it's I wrote minus k if there are 2k plus 1 prongs. Okay, that's how. Let's check now. <laughs> if there are 2k plus 1 prongs. So here I had 4, 2, uh, k plus. Uh, yes. Here there are four plongs, so k is equal to 1, and the index is minus 1. And hopefully if I get 6, I should get index uh, 6 prongs, so should have index min minus 2. Doesn't match? <laughs> yes, 6, then k is 2. OK. 2 plus 1, 3, 6. OK, good. Uh, OK. And. Uh, what uh, Poincaré Hope theorem will tell you is that the characteristics, Euler uh, characteristic of the surface, which is 2 minus 2g, has to be equal to the sum over the fixed points of the flow of the index of p. So if I add them up, the indices should match 2 minus 2g. Uh, mm, OK. So you can basically have uh, uh, no fixed points only when the genus is equal to 1, OK? A regular point would have index 0. And <coughs> OK, now let's do the second example. Uh, the second example I want to do, we did the unit square. Now I want to take uh, the unit or oh, a regular octagon. So. O will be a regular octagon. And I want to build a surface, which I will denote S O, by taking O and identifying opposite parallel sides, very much as I did in the case of the torus. Okay. Uh, so this tilde is glue parallel sides. by translations. Okay. So colors are useful here. Um, drawing all opposite sides of the same color. And you should imagine that they are identified by the unique translation, which maps one to the other. <coughs> The, the, the arrows here have no meaning. They just mean that they are glued. Okay, no deeper meaning. And then uh, I'm going to look again at uh, fifty theta. So I'll fix an angle. Ah, first of all, if you glue an octagon uh, by basic topology, you can check that you get a surface of genus two. So S O has genus two. And uh, if I fix uh, a direction, I will look at what is called also, I will also call it linear flow, 
which is again solution of the same equations I had before. So I just move it linear uh, on linear uh, on lines with constant speed in direction theta. And <coughs> solution of star. And uh, sometimes it's also called uh, uh, okay, linear flow. Um, okay, let me say it later. So what should you do? Again, you move on a straight line, and then when you hit the boundary, like before, you just use the identifications to, so if I hit here, uh, OK, you keep going, hit the red, and then. So trajectories are straight line. But I'm drawing trajectories which uh, don't hit a vertex. So from my definition, it's not so clear what happens when you hit a vertex. And. <laughs> Which color red? Do we like red? OK. So you can make an exercise and check that when you glue by uh, identifying opposite edges, I'm following what happens of a point. So this point is the same than that point, which is the same than this point, because red is glued with red, which is the same than that point, because green is glued to green. You can verify that in this picture, uh, in here, uh, so the here, ver vertices of O are all glued together and they produce uh, unique point P on the surface S. So there is a unique point which uh, uh, is glued by all the vertices of this octagon. And what happens of this point? Now I want to plot. So how many trajectories enter? Uh, enter and so there are, I'm fixing the direction. And OK, I assume it's not the direction of a side for simplicity or. Uh, you see there are three trajectories which end in, a, in this point, And there are three trajectories, which probably should put here, which uh, go out of this point when I flow in my direction theta. So I claim that this point, what it looks like, is a multi-saddle with three prongs. There are three ingoing <coughs> and three outgoing linear trajectories from this point. I might have, uh, so if you've seen it, you've seen it. If you haven't seen it, maybe you're not used to think of it. So th I mean, is it clear what I'm saying? So I'm showing you a saddle. I'm showing you a, a flow on a surface which has linear trajectories on every point. But uh, the, every point is regular, has a unique straight line trajectory passing through it. But one point, the red vertex here, which is one point on the surface where I see actually a saddle. So the, the trajectories of my flow, if I plot them on the surface, I see three of them going in and three of them going out. So uh, the other trajectories will look honest, regular trajectories like in the torus. So they will have, uh, I don't know what they will do, but uh, once I fold my octagon into a surface, they will uh, wind. Uh, on the line. Okay. <coughs> okay. So if you have never done seen this before, uh, I give you an exercise. So convince yourself what uh, what happens if I do uh, the decagon. So you take uh, decagon. Maybe I should call it D. And S D is the associated uh, surface by gluing parallel sides and uh, verify that the genus is again, ah, actually, do you know what the genus of the decagon is? OK, well, maybe, you, OK, verify. I'll give you already the solution. The genus is also two. So I will plot ST. The genus is again two, but this time uh, verify that there are 
two points which are singular, P1 and P2, and each of them will be a simple saddle. Genus is equal to two, and there are two simple saddles in the linear flow. So not all vertices of the decagon are glued to each other. They are uh, glued in two equivalence classes, and each of these will give you a four-pronged saddle for the flow. Okay, so do this if you haven't seen this picture, and ask me at the end if you. Uh, So, first of all, I hope um, that you see we said at the beginning by Poincare Hopf theorem if the genus is greater than uh, one, we cannot have a flow without fixed points. So, and we can check that the characteristic, the index here will be what will be, uh, um, I said minus two, and uh, two minus two g for genus two is uh, uh, minus two, fine. So I can have one uh, index minus two fixed point or two index minus one. And they also add up to two minus two g. Okay, so check the formula. Uh, so if you have never uh, seen this before, let me tell you, so this, uh, this, so this by this I mean phi t on SO is an example of uh, linear flow or directional flow, linear or directional on a translation surface. And uh, I will not, this is not what I want to do, but I want you to know for culture, if you don't know what this is. So this is so-called flat surface. So it's a surface which was glued out of a piece of the plane. So it's a, this, is, this is an example of a surface which carries a Euclidean metric. So there is a Euclidean metric at uh, all points which come from the interior or from the interior of the sides. But this uh, Euclidean metric uh, <coughs> actually has uh, singularities. Flat surface uh, with uh, so-called conical singularities. And these are singularities of the flat metric where, where the negative curvature is hidden. So I will not enter into this. And there is actually <coughs> beautiful uh, surveys. For example, uh, Zorich, also Yokoz taught many courses on flat surfaces. And uh, I just wanted to mention uh, um, uh, that this example is in the world of uh, uh, flat surfaces. And this is really the geodesic flow for the flat metric. So I'm moving on a straight line in the plane. But there is a remark. This linear flow is discontinuous. It's not continuous. It's not even, no, not smooth. It's actually not continuous. So. Why this flow is not continuous? Because, uh, maybe let me just write this and plot something. Singularities are hit in finite time. So I will just write this. So because I'm traveling with unit constant speed, at some point, uh, if I am on a separatrix, I will, if I am on one of these red lines, in finite time, I will hit this red dot. And when I hit the red dot, I claim that this uh, saddle splits trajectories. So the flow is not continuous. So maybe I will just plot. So if I have two trajectories here, which start very close, but 
One is to the right and one is to the left of the separatrix. One will go here, the other will go there. So, so you see this flow has a singular points that in finite time split the future history. And of course you can see it here too. So here blue, if I start here, blue uh, will follow here. And if I start there, why? This will follow the green and go here. So the trajectories are split in finite time. Okay? So, so if I want to study smooth flows, this is not an example of a smooth flow. It's not even a continuous flow. Uh, But let me tell you that uh, the ergodic theory, actually the ergodic theory of uh, these uh, linear flows on translation surfaces have been uh, very actively studied since the 80s. So it's a big, so we have someone working in Tecmula Dynamics and many people, I don't know how many people. So let me write somewhere. Uh, So the ergodic properties of these linear flows on translation surfaces are very well understood because there is a beautiful connection with Teich-Muller dynamics and uh, which acts as a renormalization on this world of translation flows. And again, Jean-Christophe Yocos, who unfortunately passed away, has taught several courses at Collège de France and maybe some of you took, I don't know, maybe not. But uh, if you want to know more about this topic, uh, there are beautiful lecture notes written by your cause. There is an upcoming book by Viana. There is a survey by Zorich, Mesur. So it's a beautiful topic. But again, uh, it's not going to be our focus. Uh, even though there is a lot of connections be between what I will teach and translation surfaces. And occasionally, I will tell you where are some similarities. And we will use from next, from Next lecture from Thursday, we will use interval exchange transformations, which are very much related to translation flows on surfaces. And we will also use some inputs from Teich-Muller dynamics, which I will tell you out of the context of Teich-Muller dynamics. So uh, I just keep in mind that this is a sister of what, it's a sister story of the story I'm telling you today. So now I need to do example three. Um, Okay, so example three, so is going to be smooth flows on higher genus surfaces, or they are somehow uh, also symplectic flows in dimension two, or they are also locally Hamiltonian flows. And so let me define, this will be our main object. Um, okay. So first I will give you the abstract definition and then I will give you a more concrete definition. So, uh, so here I want to define, let me put a title, smooth flows on higher genus surfaces. Or also called locally Hamiltonian flows. Okay. So here, as we will, we will have, we, our surface was smooth, so it's a smooth two-dimensional manifold. And um, if you want, I want to take I'll say the word symplectic, but there will be nothing symplectic in this course if you think of symplectic geometry. I'll say it and not. Uh, omega will be a symplectic form. And basically, just omega is a, a non smooth, non degenerate two form, area form, smooth area form. Okay, so think, uh, actually more than think, so omega uh, locally in charts 
will be something which looks like omega, some function, vxy, dx wedge dy. Okay? So this is what a smooth two form, where, F, where uh, v is a smooth. And if you choose right coordinates, you can actually, in a, uh, you can assume it's, the, it's really locally dx wedge dy. So standard area, Euclidean area form. And, okay. and now uh, the abstract way to get uh, area preserving or a flow which preserves uh, uh, omega is to take a closed one form now. And the flows will be in correspondence fixed. When I fix omega, uh, smooth flows will be in one-to-one -one correspondence with closed forms. So again, I will be more concrete and get to locally Hamiltonian in a second, if you don't like this. But I want to give this definition first. Um, uh, where am I? OK, so, so given eta closed one form. So d eta is 0. And let me stress that I'm not writing exact. I'm just writing closed. Then I can define a vector field on the surface. Uh, there exists a unique x vector field. Such as that, and uh, again, uh, uh, you just want to write that uh, this notation, the, con the contraction. So this is sometimes also called I x omega. So this is the contraction of the two form by the vector field is equal to uh, eta. Um, so what is this contraction? Uh, so I have a two form, so it acts on uh, vector fields. So if I, I can contract it, I just basically plug in the two form x comma dot, and this becomes a one form, and I want this one form to be my one form. Okay, so this is the meaning of this contraction. <coughs> Closed one form, con uh, such that the vector field such that when it contracted, uh, cont I contract the two form, I get my one form. So sometimes I could call it x eta. So it's uniquely determined by eta, fixed omega. And phi t, or if you want uh, phi t eta, the flow given by eta is the uh, a flow along, which integrate this vector field, along integral curves. Of, uh, uh, of, uh, x eta. Okay. Very abstract definition, but let me be. Uh, <coughs> this is also a definition that I will not use explicitly, but uh, well, mm, we will soon go to a much more concrete description, and especially Thursday. But uh, this is the definition of. Uh, um, uh, OK, M maybe let me say something. So first of all, let me do one more thing in this context. So this flow, phi t, phi t eta, phi t eta preserves, preserves omega. So this is, I, in this way, I basically get a flow which preserves the two form. Or maybe I should say, if mu is the area given by integrating omega, if I have a two form, I can integrate it and I get a measure. I get an area. This is my area form. If mu is the area, then uh, when I say uh, basically I have that this flow preserves mu. So it's area preserving in the sense I defined at the beginning. So it's a way to get area preserving flow. And essentially, it's an if and only if. So every smooth area preserving flow can be written in this formalism of uh, one forms and two forms. Okay? And uh, let me just say it. Uh, 
uh, what is the proof. So first of all, I'll preserve uh, omega. It's basically equivalent, this again, to say that the lead derivative, this is a little bit of differential geometry if you want, preserving this area form is the same than saying that the lead derivative is uh, uh, 0. Uh, but now if we compute this lead derivative, and you know lead derivatives, then there is a chain formula, if you want, or product formula for E derivatives. <coughs> uh, I don't know if you write it like this. And in this case, uh, this is equal to 0, because the omega is 0. And uh, by definition, the contraction of omega on x is actually eta. And uh, this is, by definition, of x. x was such that the contraction is eta. And eta was closed. So eta being closed is equivalent to this flow preserving the area form. Okay? So this is the one line proof. <laughs> so let me now be more concrete and we'll be even more concrete on Thursday. But uh, uh, one way to think of this is basically uh, to think of these flows are locally given by Hamiltonian equations. So alternatively, so if I have omega, uh, so in local coordinates, in local coordinates, uh, so if I, uh, on a small open set, of my surface uh, in suitable order. You can find local coordinates if uh, omega in suitable order coordinates can be written as uh, really dx wedge dy. So you can always choose coordinates where your uh, uh, function is identity equal to 1. Okay? This may be sometimes, I guess they're called the are book coordinate or symplectic coordinates if you like symplectic geometry. Uh, and eta locally, by locally I mean on U, small open set, simply connected open set, uh, is exact. So a closed form on a simply connected uh, open set will be exact. So this one locally will look like dh for some smooth h from u to r. Okay? So locally my closed form will be of the form dh. And I claim, and if you want you can try to prove it as an exercise, that um, if you want it's an exercise. Uh, this flow phi t eta, in this coordinate, in this coordinate, is the solution to H, our system of Hamiltonian equation. So let me write it again. Uh, so this u, in these coordinates, let's call them x, y, uh, on, or, or in U. So if I call my point, it's a coordinate, so we are in R2. I call x, y my coordinate. And what I'm really doing, I'm moving along uh, dy minus dh dx. These are the uh, standard Hamiltonian uh, equations, okay? So hence, uh, phi t eta is called locally Hamiltonian flow. Uh, 
on the surface as. So again, preserving a smooth area form is equivalent to being locally Hamiltonian. So being locally solution of this Hamilton equation on neighborhoods, on patches of my surfaces. But I'm not saying it's a Hamiltonian flow. I'm saying it's a locally Hamiltonian flow. And now wording and be uh, a global, a global H might not exist. So it's not a Hamiltonian flow because I don't necessarily have a globally defined function H on my surface such that I only have locally defined. So what is somehow well defined is D, D, uh, so D, 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 H, maybe it's a bit, D, H is globally defined. And uh, maybe let me give you an example again. So first I have a question. So we already go, so have, has anybody been to other of these courses? So do we have a break normally or not? <laughs> no, but I want to know. If maybe we want to break. <laughs> I don't know. So I'm happy to do a so say five minutes break, but I just don't. They will all disappear and then never. I haven't told you the, the the fun part. I'm still going slowly on definitions, and I want to give you in the second hour a sense of <laughs> what is happening. So okay, let me finish. I will give you this example of non. Uh, uh, global Hamiltonian, and then we have a five minutes break, and then I will tell you what has happened about what do we know about chaotic properties of locally Hamiltonian flows and why should we study them. So, <laughs> okay, so let me just give you the example, and the example is just what we had before. So, if Phi theta, theta is not uh, Hamiltonian. Because, uh, so if there existed an H from T2 to, to uh, it's locally Hamiltonian, but not Hamiltonian. So if there was a globally defined H, uh, uh, H ha has minima or maxima. But in this flow, but the H here is never zero. So in this linear flow, you don't have uh, zeros. So if it was Hamiltonian, uh, I cannot have a function on a compact surface which we doesn't have critical points. So this already is an example of a non-Hamiltonian. So and maybe let me tell you another remark, then stop. So Novikov, uh, which will be a starting point of the second hour for the motivation to study one motivation for locally Hamiltonian flows. Novikov calls this flow, uh, 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 calls them uh, in the 90s, uh, has, um, maybe actually I should say locally Hamiltonian. I might be the one who started calling them locally Hamiltonian on a regular basis. I think the name that, uh, I think it locally Hamiltonian conveys well this notion of locally Hamiltonian. <laughs> but uh, uh, Novikov would call them multi-valued Hamiltonian flows. Because you can define, uh, you can define an H which is multi-valued. So you could define a, a Hamiltonian H, but once you do a loop, a non-trivial loop on, in, in homology, your function has to be a translate of what you had before. So it's well defined up to constants. Okay, so so that the one form is well defined. Yes. Exactly. You can think you can go to the universal cover, and on the universal cover, any your closed form is exact. So on the universal cover, it's well defined. So, but if you descend, it's multi-valued, and the multi-value are related to the periods of your exactly. Okay. So after we have five minutes break, so just to relax a little bit, and then I will tell you why Novikov wanted to study these flows and 
what <laughs> will be <laughs> proving about them uh, during the rest of the course. Okay, so thanks. Have a few minutes, yeah, <laughs> break to <laughs> relax. Okay, so we spent a lot of time motivating the study of the dynamical systems as flows, and we want to care about smooth flows on surfaces. And now we got our third real example of how you can get a smooth area preserving flow. Uh, on a surface, okay? This, uh, uh, I will always call them locally Hamiltonian flows, but it's equivalent to preserving a smooth uh, uh, area form, okay? And uh, uh, I didn't plot a picture, but if I were to plot a picture, I could have plotted actually the same picture we had before. Uh, we could have plotted the same uh, picture that I got from the octagon, but there is a crucial difference if you uh, uh, now look at this locally Hamiltonian uh, uh, flow. So maybe let me remark this. Uh, so if there, there will always be saddles, there will always be singular points, it's a matter of life. We will always have either centers or single saddles or higher saddles, but Fitty <coughs> uh, locally Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, basically, if I'm traveling on a separatrices, uh, uh, it takes infinite, infinite time to reach the saddle. To reach a singularity, okay, let's write saddles. Uh, center you cannot reach. So if you have a singularity, basically what is happening is that you never reach it in finite time. And if you have a trajectory uh, which uh, which uh, comes close to the cent to the saddle, it slows down. It kind of takes infinite amount of time. So it's not that there are no saddles, just that they are not visible in finite time. That's the difference, okay? Subtle, but uh, that's the difference. And then, uh, okay, so why should we uh, care about locally Hamiltonian flows? And uh, I'm still in the introductory move. So I did this uh, uh, course like a long seminar. So you start with a long introduction, then we will do lots of preliminary, and then we will get the proofs. So <laughs> it's today it's lots of motivation day. So let me write some motivation. So motivation zero, I've already said it. It's a basic smooth low dimensional dynamical system. So this I'm just rewriting it. But it should be obvious that okay, if you are a mathematician, area preserving flows on surfaces are very basic object we want to understand. But there is a physical motivation. If you like physics, there is a motivation from solid state physics. So this is recorded. Like, so I cannot say when they ask you why do you care, and, uh, people like to say, oh, solid state physics. <laughs> I think it's, I really, I'm perfectly happy to say they are fundamental mathematical dynamical system. But also in solid state physics, you might really want to study this. And this is indeed uh, the motivation of Novikov school. Novikov, Novikov and his school in the 90s. So Novikov uh, was the one who uh, um, suggested multi-valued Hamiltonian, I should say then, multi-valued Hamiltonian as a model for, um, I just write this, electrons, transport of electrons in a metal in, uh, under a magnetic field. So you have a metal and you have a magnetic field and you want to study transport, electron transports in this metal. And uh, he has a model, uh, model for electrons in a metal under a magnetic field. And, and maybe let me write, um, don't ask me what this means because uh, uh, let's ask someone else, but let me write what is in semi-classical uh, approximation. And that means that um, you want to treat, uh, use quantum mechanics 
to treat uh, the electrons, but uh, classically, we want to treat classically the magne magnetic field. And uh, whatever that means, uh, I claim that in this model, basically, this model really reduces to study uh, locally Hamiltonian flows on surfaces. So his motivation was uh, this one from solid state physics. And, 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 uh, and let me tell you one key word on Fermi surfaces. So basically, the surfaces come from energy levels. Uh, basically, you have some energy, and level sets of these energy functions are give you the surface. And your electron is constrained okay. on traveling on the Fermi surface. And the magnetic field give you the restriction of also being in the magnetic field give you this locally Hamiltonian flow. And to give you a sense of why this, uh, where it is coming from, this is very interconnected with two. So let me write two and try to explain. And uh, let me try it through. Pseudo periodic topology. So, and. Uh, so uh, I will tell you this is connected to one. So what is the question in pseudo-periodic topology? And there is one special case. So you take uh, S, which is a periodic surface in R3. And by periodic, I mean uh, Z3 periodic, say. Say it is a lattice of symmetry in your surface. And let me plot how a periodic surface might look in a unit cube, which is the period. It might look like this. I don't know. This is, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, imagine some kind of uh, fundamental unit of surface. Here there is a boundary component. But I have to repeat this periodically on R3. So I cannot draw. I, this is where you. OK, if you open, uh, uh, OK, if you search on the internet, I don't have pictures, search Fermi surface, gold Fermi surface, or some metal Fermi surface, and you will see these pictures of a periodic surface in R3. So Fermi surfaces are actually, uh, Fermi energy level surfaces are periodic surfaces in R3. And if I look on, on R3, mod uh, uh, Z3, I get a closed, uh, uh, if I identify these open components in the, in the block, I get a closed surface. So this is the surface I was having before, which is a block of my pseudo-periodic, uh, uh, my periodic surface. And what is the pseudo-periodic? Then you take a plane, so intersect with a plane, uh, actually more than on a plane, uh, with the pa uh, intersect with the uh, family of parallel planes. Right, so you give some family of planes in R3, and you slice your surface with these planes. And these planes, you should really, uh, this is kind of an abstract version of one, so your surface could be the Fermi energy level surface. Air traveling on a plane is related to the magnetic field. So you're kind of intersecting a constraint from energy surface with the constraint of uh, having a magnetic field. And the intersections, intersections will be one dimensional. So I have a surface sliced by planes. And intersections are trajectories, how do they look like on the surface, right? I have the surface, which is the quotient of the periodic one. I intersect with the plane. And if I, I get the foliation, and these uh, leaves of this one-dimensional foliations are trajectories of a locally Hamiltonian flow. OK? So that's another instance. And I, again, I'm not going to uh, say more about this, but uh, there is a nice uh, survey by Anton Zorich, 
I think it's also in some more recent survey, but there is an old volume published which is called uh, Pseudo-Periodic Topology. And there he tells you more in general, pseudo-periodic topology has to do with uh, your periodic surface could be in RN and they could intersect with uh, hyperplanes and there is higher dimensional version, but we'll stick to R3 and two dimensional planes. And uh, uh, okay, so, uh, and he has a survey, how do the leaves of uh, uh, wind around, how do the closed leaves wind around the surface? And I must say, this is my understanding of the situation is that, so Novikov uh, was very much interested in how these trajectories look like on the universal cover in R3. So if I travel along one of these one dimensional trajectories in R3 on my pseudo, on my periodic surface, what do I see? Do, is there some direction which I asymptotically follow? Are there deviations? And these questions are, have to do with kind of um, also how this flow acts on homology of the surface. And uh, Dinikov has kept working. There are also some recent results of um, uh, with Sasha Skripchenka and Uber and uh, Artur Avila and, uh, and uh, also uh, somehow, but historically Zorich also was, uh, as a student, was interested in these questions, he wrote when he wrote this survey. And then at some point, if you just care about these questions like asymptotic direction, you don't care about how you move on the trajectory, with which speed you move. You just care about the topology kind of, of the... So in some sense, it turns out, as I will explain probably Thursday, that these locally Hamiltonian flows can be seen in many cases as time changes of translation flows. So sometimes they have the same trajectories of a linear flow, just that I move differently. For example, I slow down when I get to a saddle. So this uh, speed <laughs> matters a lot when you study chaotic properties, but doesn't matter for other questions. So I think this was one of the motivation that gave a push to take Muller dynamics and to the study of translation surfaces and linear flows. And there was the konsevich zoris conjecture that then were, was solved by uh, Avila and Forney. And then there was uh, uh, Forney's work on deviations over ergodic averages. So a lot of this was motivated also by this Novikov and pseudo-periodic topology. But uh, for chaotic properties that we will study now, uh, you cannot cheat and go to the, well, cheat. <laughs> you cannot go to the world of translation surfaces. You need to stick to locally Hamiltonian flows. And that's what we will do in this course. And maybe something which is indeed special of locally Hamiltonian flow, and this is my third motivation, third and last. Uh, I want to say that, uh, first let me start with a remark. So FIT, uh, area preserving uh, on, on the surface, have zero entropy. And I'm not going to define entropy. It's uh, many, so do you know what entropy is? Curiosity, yeah. So if you know what the entropy is, these are an example of zero entropy dynamical systems. Uh, it's a measure of how chaotic a dynamical system is. And uh, actually this was proven by Lai Sang Yang, probably in the 70s, I didn't check the, so smooth area preserving flows, uh, or in general area preserving flows have zero entropy. So they are in some sense, uh, let me have a digression. So, dynamical systems very roughly are uh, classified, classified, boundaries sometimes are smooth, but sometimes there are three big categories, hyperbolic dynamical systems, elliptic dynamical systems, and parabolic. <coughs> So, first of all, hyperbolic dynamical, I'm not going to give you definitions, but one feature of hyperbolic, uh, 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 hyperbolic is that they have positive entropy. So hyperbolic dynamical systems have positive entropy. 
parabolic and elliptic have entropy zero. And I claim that this, sorry, I didn't say area preserving flows. Maybe I will say it now. Um, okay. Okay, okay, maybe I'll say it. So area preserving flows are in the parabolic category. So what's in here? Elliptic, for example, linear flows on tori and perturbations of linear flows on tori are elliptic dynamical system. And uh, hyperbolic, for example, the geodesic flow on a negatively curved uh, uh, hyperbolic surface is an example, or if you transformation a nose of uh, diffeomorphisms, I don't know. It, I'm the, if you don't know dynamical systems, don't worry. I'm just trying to, for those who know, I'm putting some boxes. So we are in between. We are in this parabolic world when we study higher genus uh, area preserving flows. So a feature is that we have zero entropy. So we are not hyperbolic, but uh, one rough way to distinguish these categories is look at the butterfly effect. So look at sensitive dependence on initial condition. So if uh, your system is chaotic in the popular image that you have, uh, this butterfly effect tells you that if I start with initial conditions which are nearby and move them, these conditions will diverge. Okay? So uh, elliptic system, so th this is also called no butterfly effect, no sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Uh, on a linear flow on the torus, two uh, nearby orbits stay together forever. In a, a hyperbolic and parabolic world, on the other hand, there is a butterfly uh, effect. Or sensitive dependence on initial conditions, more formally. But the key difference is that in the hyperbolic world, this divergence of nearby trajectory is exponential. So it, things diverge very fast. Instead, in this parabolic realm, there is divergence, but somehow slower than exponential. So maybe I would say parabolic flows. have entropy zero, but sub-exponential, sub-exponential. And actually this usually polynomial or sub-polynomial, sub-exponential divergence of nearby trajectories. You can take this as a meta definition of parabolic flows, okay? And I claim that area preserving flows on smooth area preserving flows on surfaces are to me one of the fundamental classes of parabolic flows that you want to study. So I kind of, I think I <laughs> my own research is not only about flows on surfaces, but I think it's only about entropy zero. So I like parabolic dynamics. I'm trying to understand what are features of parabolic dynamical systems. So I very much like this as one of the key examples. And just again, to put things in a context, I think there are three main examples. And if you don't know what they are, it's not the time to define them. Uh, 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 so first of all, uh, this is for people who do know some dynamics. So on hyperbolic, on a surface with a negative constant curvature minus one, you have a geodesic and horocycle flow. So geodesic is the hyperbolic flow. The horocycle flow is probably one of the main examples of, uh, of parabolic flows. And in general, you have unipotent flows in homogeneous dynamics, unipotent flows on semi-simple Lie groups. This is a key example. And in homogeneous dynamics, you also have nil flows, nil flows on nil manifolds. And this I'm, I'm telling you basic parabolic flows examples. And the last example I want to write here is smooth, uh, uh, local, smooth area preserve, uh, locally Hamiltonian. surfaces okay so and 
They were writing the um, introduction of a joint paper with uh, Davide and Giovanni, who is here, <laughs> who was my PhD student, and then uh, Giovanni Forni. So we'll meet tomorrow to finish writing this introduction, and we had a whole discussion of what should we call them. So Horus cycle flow, in analogy to the hyperbolic world, we could call it uniformly parabolic flow. <laughs> and <laughs> near flows are something called like uh, partially parabolic flows, because they are not parabolic in every direction. And these uh, Hamiltonian flows are <coughs> non-uniformly parabolic flows. So to me, I want to sell you it's a key example because it's a non-uniformly parabolic flow. Okay, so to me this is the most important of all motivations I gave you so far. And uh, okay, that's enough. I hope you're motivated, are you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this is really, I'm kind of trying to uh, think we uh, don't understand parabolic dynamics and what are features of parabolic dynamics and uh, uh, these three classes are main models and then you may want to look at perturbations of these three classes and time changes and, and this is another story that I'm not telling um, this time but okay uh, chaotic properties so I, I need to get to state something, otherwise don't can, I cannot let you go without having stating some theorems we want to prove. <coughs> so Arnold conjecture. Uh, Arnold conjecture. So um, shortly after Novikov uh, was, was with his school was suggesting studying locally Hamiltonian flows, Arnold uh, wrote a paper which started some key study of chaotic properties. So take uh, phi t locally Hamiltonian <coughs> on the torus on a surface of genus 1 on T2, <laughs> genus 1, OK? And uh, we already said that linear flows uh, we don't want to study linear flows because they are elliptic. And I want to, even if I don't have to have singularities, I want, I can look at flows with singular points on the torus. So with one simple saddle, and if I put a simple saddle by Poincaré Hopf, I'm bound also to put some other singularity, and one center, okay? So I have simple saddle and center. So I have area preserving flow with one sim on the torus with one center and one saddle. So, uh, so Arnold in the 90s uh, early 90s so he remarked uh, that uh, you, you have to have actually if you have a, set, a center and you have uh, uh, area preserving flow you also need to have a set loop so in this picture Uh, remarked, remarked that, that there is uh, what I call saddle loop. What is a saddle loop? It's a separatrix which comes back to the saddle. So a trajectory which goes from saddle to saddle making a loop. So this is a saddle loop. Okay, so it's a trajectory, so equal separatrix connecting saddle back to itself, OK? Uh, saddle loop, which bounds, bounds, which bounds uh, the island of periodic orbit. Okay, 
So the phase portrait of your, the trajectories of your flow around the center, we already said they are closed. And this uh, is inside uh, the saddle loop, okay? And uh, the rest, I don't know yet. Uh, so this is sometimes called this, uh, ob this uh, center filling a saddle loop. This is called the trap. So here, nothing interesting happens. My orbits are nothing interesting. If you like closed orbits, you are happy. There are many simple closed orbits with periodic trajectory. Here your flow is periodic. Okay? But uh, uh, Arnold conjecture is about what happens in the complement of this trap. So what's the dynamics in the complement of the trap? So let me write it like this. What's <coughs> dynamics outside the trap? And uh, let me say uh, uh, that uh, topologically, Actually, it's the same uh, than a linear flow in the torus. Uh, it's like a linear flow. Uh, so let me, let me uh, remember what the picture of a linear flow we had before. So I start from a linear flow. And let me say that I make a hole in my, in my uh, uh, at some point I put here a saddle loop like this. And I maybe deform my trajectories a little bit to fit this uh, trap. So what am I plotting here? I'm first plotting a linear flow and then I'm making a little hole. So it's like I had a torus with a hole. And on the complement I have trajectories which look like a linear flow. See? To Really think of what we had before, just uh, draw inside at some point, transform one of these trajectory into a separatrix with a loop and uh, make the form a little bit uh, what happened before. And uh, the main, um, uh, so actually Fit uh, uh, restricted to the complement of the trap. is now co today called, is nowadays called also Arnold flow. Arnold didn't call it Arnold flow, but because of this uh, uh, paper by Arnold and conjecture by Arnold, sometimes when I say Arnold flow, I mean the flow on the complement of this trivial island uh, region, okay? So the conjecture of Arnold is about uh, the chaotic properties of this uh, Arnold flow. And uh, state it. Uh, conjecture and I write an old flow, <laughs> so complement on of the uh, restriction to the complement of the trap. And I will write typically. And this typically I will comment on later. So, uh, so this Arnold flow is related to a linear flow. And typically means for irrational directions which are maybe satisfy some Diophantine conditions. So sufficiently irrational rotation numbers, if you know what that means. But typically for, uh, if I pick one at random, uh, Conjectures that as a null flow are typically are mixing. Okay, so now I will define what mixing means. Uh, definition. Again, this is not a dynamics course, but I'm trying to give basic dynamic definition. So by for curiosity, has anybody who knows what mixing means? 
half or more than half, more than half, but so I will give the definition nevertheless, but uh, because there are people who do not, but maybe not. Okay, so say that I have a uh, setup of ergodic theory. Uh, measure preserving, so measure space, mu of x is one, so probability measure, and phi t from x to x preserves measure mu, preserves preserving mu, is mixing if <coughs> for every a, b, in b, for every a, b, and b, for every two sets, if I take a set A and I flow it uh, and I look uh, at how much uh, of A intersects some set B, so I have a set A somewhere in my space, a set B somewhere else in my space, and I start moving A and look at how much A intersects B after time t. So if it's mixing, uh, what happens is that this uh, measure of this intersection converges as t tends to infinity to the product of the measure of A and the measure of B. Uh, so another way to uh, say this is that A and B uh, so phi t of A and, and B, uh, maybe let me say some keywords if you, for those who haven't seen mixing, uh, become independent asymptotically. This is kind of a probabilistic notion. Or if you like a geometric notion, phi t of A spreads. spreads uniformly uh, with respect to the measure mu. So the set A kind of mixing really gives you this image. When I flow A, it kind of spreads in all space in mm, proportionally to mu, OK? And uh, OK, and uh, again, equivalently, for every f and g in L2. Another way to say it, if you like functions more than sets, and you can check as an exercise of measure theory. Uh, for every f in L2, if I look at uh, what is called the correlation, t correlation between f and g, which is equal to uh, the integral of f composed with the flow times a g in d mu. So I take two functions, and one I compose with the flow, the other I don't, and uh, I look at this correlation. This converges, and t tends to infinity, to the product, to this kind of decorrelate. So, so this correlation integral converges to the product. This basically a characteristic function will give you the previous definition. And, uh, Sometimes people, for if you look at special classes of functions, you can talk of decay of correlation. And this quantity is decaying. If the functions are mean zero, it goes to zero. And you can ask how fast they decay for certain subclass of smooth functions. OK, so so reality check. This is a very strong property to ask for a flow on a surface. So maybe I'm running a little bit short of time. So, so let me just say it quickly. So linear flows on T2 are not mixing. So if I just go on with this uh, straight line uh, unit speed, you can convince yourself that if I take a ball and flow it, nothing interesting will happen to your ball. Your ball will travel, will not spread. 
will travel at constant stable. Okay, so this is not true for linear flows and for linear flows on translation surfaces. So we had our basic example of uh, the octagon, where again I travel with a straight line with unit speed, uh, are never mixing. And this is one of the very first results uh, on translation flows proven by Anatol Katok, who also died recently last summer. It's one of the great names in dynamics that we're going to miss a lot. And he has an early day paper on where he proves that this absence of mixing. I will say this a little bit of this probably in one of the next lectures. So I want to say example one and example two that we saw today are not mixing. So mixing for a flows on a surface area preserving is some sense not something you expect, having seen these two examples. But nevertheless, Arnaud conjecture <coughs> mixing for this locally Hamiltonian flow on the torus. And uh, um, uh, let me remark for non-dynamicists. So mixing actually implies uh, ergodicity. which I will not define now, and actually implies, because the measure is smooth, it implies that almost every trajectory of the flow is uh, uh, dense, dense on the surface and uniformly distributed. So uh, it implies that a typical trajectory will fill the surface and spend in each set, some time proportional to the measure of the set. So it's a very strong chaotic notion. And maybe we will go back to mixing uh, as we uh, move forward. So I want to state something. So first of all, this specific conjecture in genus one, uh, so Arnold conjecture uh, was proved shortly after he formulated it by Jakob Sinai, who was my PhD advisor in Princeton. So actually, he was the one who started me on all this story of locally Hamiltonian flows. And uh, um, uh, Hanin, also in the 90s. And uh, uh, I will also say that there are many, several papers by Kochergin who actually improved on the result of Sinai Hanin. So proved uh, a better, almost every, a better typical, a, a better class. But again, we will state these theorems precisely as we <coughs> probably, uh, already tomorrow I can state it precisely. But so, okay, great. But uh, Arnold conjecture is only for genus one. But I told you since the beginning, I'm interested in surfaces of genus two and above. So if genus is two are typical locally Hamiltonian flows, mixing. So this is kind of a, a, a the general question that uh, stayed open for, so as I said, the genus one case was solved, I think, just two, two years after Arnold asked the question. But uh, the higher genus case, uh, now we have a really full picture, and uh, that's what I want to finish the lecture with, and, and what I will want to explain. But it stayed open for 20 years, essentially, after Arnold posed the question. So I want to finish this lecture with some results with some summary of results that will be the main core uh, of what we will uh, go to. OK, so now we have, uh, uh, first of all, maybe I should say uh, typical. So, so on locally Hamiltonian flows, uh, 
uh, one can put a topology. And all of this we will do later in the course. So I'm just saying heuristically what we will do. So there is a topology. Essentially, you can perturb them by adding a, an exact form. So it will be perturbation by adding a small exact form. And this will give you a neighborhood, an open set. And there is a measure, measure class, measure class. So there is like, like a measure class on the space of the flows. We will do this carefully later on. And uh, typically, when I say typical, I mean almost every uh, or full measure. So it's in the measure theoretical sense. So I want to say what is the typical in this uh, measure on, on this species. And, uh, uh, and now there is a full classification. of the uh, mixing properties of these flows. So I will draw, uh, and maybe let me put another, uh, assume that the singularities are non-degenerate, i.e. all its centers and simple saddle. Is center or simple center. So I, if you have actually, um, or maybe I should say in the full classification, maybe it's, let me say like this. If there is a multiple saddle, if your flow has just one multiple saddle, uh, the flow is mixing. And this was discovered much earlier, even before Arnold. It's Kochergin in the 70s. And uh, somehow this is though non-generic. So these degenerate saddles are kind of, uh, um, uh, so there is an open set where you don't have degenerate saddles. You can easily perturb a degenerate saddle and only non-degenerate saddles are open. And this was indeed beyond before um, uh, Arnold conjectures. Arnold says, well, Kochergin proved that if there is a degenerate saddle, the flow is mixing, but our flow has only a simple saddle. The methods of Kochergin do not apply. Kochergin has also some results on non-mixing. So Arnold asked his conjecture. So say, say for a second that we are in the non-degenerate case. So the picture that, again, it's a pre-view, but because we'll formulate it more precisely, but the picture is that the answer is it depends on whether or not there are saddle loops. So the picture will be that there are two open sets, u1 and v2. So the picture which we know today is that there are u1 and u2, there are open sets, open set where the where there are only simple saddles. Mm. For example, on genus two, two simple saddles. So this is an open set in a suitable topology. And U2 is instead the set where there are saddle loops homologous to zero, I should say. I will go back to this. Uh, set the loops. For example, Arnold flow is in U2. So there is a picture like this. And homologous to zero means that your loop separates the surface in two connected components. So here I have a disk and the rest. Okay. And it turns out that the saddle loops are persistent in this suitable topology. So if I perturb, I still have a saddle loop. We will go back to this. So you have these two open sets. And uh, so here you have uh, only simple saddles. And here you have these uh, saddle loops. And for example, so if there exists a center we saw by Arnold, where well we saw, I told you that this implies that there is also a saddle loop. So 
If you have a center, you are in U2. And uh, uh, I will wrap up. And uh, the picture that we know today is uh, uh, a full understanding of what is going on. So basically, the uh, summary is that in U1, uh, almost every, almost every, or uh, typ let me just write the typical, typical locally Hamiltonian flow is not mixing. Maybe I'll write it like this. Is not mixing. Uh, is not mixing, uh, but on the other hand, uh, these words we will go back and define, but minimal, ergodic, and weak mixing, which is uh, something just less than mixing. And uh, in U2, for U2, uh, the typical <coughs> for U2, so uh, maybe I should write for a for in uh, U2 prime open set, uh, open and dense set. There is an open and dense set of U2, and uh, such the typical uh, Fit is not minimal. Uh, I didn't. I was a little bit too fast. So it's not minimal means. Uh, that there are, for example, there are traps or there are areas which uh, there are not all trajectories are dense, but I, I will actually, uh, I'm, not, I'm too much towards the end to explain properly. This is just a picture that I will explain later on. Uh, but let me say mixing on each minimal component. So this is the case of Arnold flow, where I have uh, an area with closed orbits, but in the complement I'm mixing. And what this means, I will, uh, I will explain. Uh, and actually, much more is known. And you can even say uh, mixing of all orders and uh, uh, mixing with quantitative estimates. And these results, where do they come from? Uh, not mixing is actually uh, something which I proved uh, uh, now almost ten, not 10 years, no, 11, oh, what is it? Okay, uh, eight years. Um, I think it was really proven 10 years ago. And uh, it's a paper uh, which appeared in Anaso Mathematics, which is answering this global uh, Arnold conjecture in any genus. And, uh, uh, Minimal and ergodic come from uh, translation flows. So this is a result of Mazur and simultaneously Vich for translation flows, which I will not dwell into. And weak mixing is also something that I proved in, uh, uh, this is 2009. Uh, what about mixing in U2? So for, mm, and I should say that there were special results by uh, uh, Sheklov in genus 2 and by uh, Kocergin in some not exactly smooth case but related case. And uh, um, mixing here, it's actually I had a special case. This was my PhD thesis actually in, uh, uh, in a special case which I will describe uh, Thursday. But the general case, it actually was proven by Davide, who is Ravotti, who is sitting here. <laughs> no, no pressure, OK. In uh, what year? It appeared in 16, maybe no. Uh, 17, OK. And uh, uh, also with quantitative mixing estimates. And turns out that mixing happens, but the decay of correlation is very slow. It's something like sub-exponential or sub-polynomial, logarithmic. And uh, very recently, there has been a lot of uh, new uh, progress. So actually, maybe I will write in, in U2, you also have mixing of all orders. 
and you have results on, uh, uh, okay, then there are results, related results on the spectrum of these flows for some cases, and there is the results on, uh, on uh, um, uh, what did I want to say? Uh, spectrum and uh, okay there's a lot of recent activity uh, pushing uh, beyond mixing in these flows so this is somehow a vague um, uh, I will have to stop but this is somehow what I want to go into is in some sense explaining this picture so my goal I will kind of slowly connect uh, locally Hamiltonian flows with their Poincare map interval exchange transformations we will do this uh, Thursday and uh, explain special flows representations, which are a basic tool in dynamical system. And uh, uh, I want to basically uh, if start next week to define some basic tools on interval exchanges and, and Birkhoff sums and study of Birkhoff sums for non-integrable functions. So some basic dynamical tools will be set up on Thursday. And I will try on Thursday to give you a precise statement of this dichotomy. So these two statements on mixing or absence of mixing in a simpler language, so very concrete language. So Thursday I will state formally, I will do some preliminary work and state a little bit these theorems. And then in the week after, I will actually sketch a proof of uh, those uh, results. So I will sketch a proof of some uh, mixing and absence of mixing in these two setup. And behind this, there is some nice geometric arguments on shearing. There is some analytic tools on estimates on Birkhoff sums for functions which are not in L1. And there is some um, arithmetic number theoretical tool. There are diophantine conditions for interval exchange transformation. So all these tools, I want to give you a flavor and the foundation of what they are and how they come into play. So my goal is to explain the tools carefully and uh, sketch the outline of this uh, picture of classification. So I, I just got the introduction and hopefully I gave you an idea of the topic and then on Thursday we will start uh, slowly with uh, describing Poincare maps and special flows representation and continuing from there, okay? Sorry for running a little bit. <laughs> we rec five extra minutes of the break we <laughs> took him now. Thanks, yeah. Good.